ahead and uh, start the program. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ramesh Ayala. Um, uh, I'm chair at USFI Institute in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my colleague here is Dr. Vinay Gupta. He's a professor in All India Ophthalmology, uh, in All India Institute in Ophthalmology, right down the street here. Uh, today we thought we're going to present to you the changing face of glaucoma surgery. Glaucoma is a varied disease process and doing the same surgery, i.e. trabeculectomy, for every single glaucoma is not right and your results are not going to be optimal. And, and so the, the talk today is more about how you approach, what are the various glaucoma surgeries that are out there that we use in our practice. Um, here are all my financial disclosures. The only thing that I'll show you related to my financial disclosures are um, at the very end, and I'll highlight that on new research that's coming to uh, force, and hopefully you'll see it in the marketplace in the near future. So glaucoma, as we know, is a blinding disease, the second leading cause for blindness worldwide. 80 million affected worldwide, 10 million blind worldwide, and about 100 million by 2040. As the population is aging, the incidence of glaucoma is going to increase, and it's going to become a tremendous burden right behind cataract. At least with cataract surgery, you can restore vision. With glaucoma untreated, it's going to lead to permanent blindness, and once vision is lost, there's no going backwards. Now here is, so the, the entire focus of uh, today's talk is going to be surgical glaucoma. Medical glaucoma, you probably know more about it than I do. Um, so here is a glaucoma pyramid. Look at the, the way the treatment is going to be. Most of the, the bottom one, the two thirds you can see is either drops or drops plus laser. The top one third of the pyramid is occupied by traditional glaucoma surgery. Uh, by traditional glaucoma surgery. So, excuse me, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, cataracts, like cataract surgery is common to all aspects of glaucoma patients, common to all of them. So, can we do something at an earlier stage that is minimally invasive and has complication rates similar to cataract surgery? That's a big issue with glaucoma, right? So, MIGS and cataract surgery have evolved to be the answer in the bottom two thirds of the patient base. Traditional glaucoma surgery traps and GDDs or glaucoma drainage devices still rule the top one third of the case uh, with advanced glaucomas. Trabeculectomy, let's start with trabeculectomy, um, one of the oldest glaucoma surgeries that we've been practicing from 1965 onwards, evolved in 1960s, it diverts aqueous humor into the subconjunctal space was sclerotomy or keratectomy. Um, so fluid flow regulation is initial uh, way to control the pressure to, through via the scleral flap and sutures is what we control the rate of aqueous outflow into subconjunctal space. In the long term, subconjunctal fibrosis causes the, leads to the failure of this, uh, this surgery. So we've been using metamycin application one time at the time of surgery to control it. Um, the, the fibrosis, so the long-term success rate as it's been published by various authors. Maltino did the longest study in his New Zealand-based population, most of them white people, old people. Um, 13 millimeters of mercury in 10 years on one med with 10% failure rate. Now this is strictly applicable to the white old population in New Zealand. It's not applicable to our patient population here, I guarantee you that. 13 millimeters in two years in one med with 30% failure rate in mixed population in our study that I published three times in New Orleans. So New Orleans is like India. We have a lot of pigmented patient population that's very applicable to what you see in here in India. So take it from me, you're not going to get a 10% success failure rate in 10 years in Indian population. It's more like 30 to 40% failure rate in two years because of excessive subconjunctal fibrosis. Um, now, in terms of complications, 10% is the rule, 10% coronal effusions, about 10% ptosis, 20% cataract formation, and about 30% blood fibrosis. Um, one to 3% of these patients may end up with so-called hemorrhage, about one to 13%, depending on which study you're, you're, uh, you're following, uh, with endophthalmitis that can lead to blindness. And of course, leaky cystic blood incidence has increased up to 20 to 30 percent in this era of metamycin usage. Depending upon how much metamycin you're going to use at the time of the surgery, it's like dropping a nuclear bomb into the subconjunctal space. It's going to wipe out all the fibroblasts along with that vascular vasculature, and that leads to cystic leaky bluffs. That in turn can lead to increased incidence of endophthalmitis. Now, the application of metamycin um, is one of two ways. Uh, you can either apply 
using a Vexel. It's never been standardized so far, by the way. So you can use it with a Vexel with a, with a concentration that you like that is suitable for your patient population that you will find with the first 100 cases that you're going to do. I use a 0.4 milligram per cc concentration. I've always done that. I vary the time. I usually don't use it for more than one minute. The 45 seconds is all that I use. Too much of metamycin, like I said, is destructive to the overall architecture of the blood. Now, some people have taken to subconjunctival injection of low-dose metamycin prior to surgery. You have to be careful if you want to follow that technique because if the mitomycin spreads diffusely into the subconjunctiva throughout the superior fornix area, I can, you can take it from me, it's going to cause long-term avascular fibro, avascular conjunctiva that's going to get stuck down to the underlying sclera to the point that even putting in a tube in those eyes is going to become very difficult. So if you want to do subconjunctival injection, be very careful. Do it in a localized fashion in the area that you're going to do your surgery so it doesn't get diffused. If you end up with a cystic blood, now one of the things that you have to understand is this glaucoma is known to have a lot of side effects that or complications. Uh, and I urge every one of you who want to practice glaucoma surgery to know your complications and know how to manage them. Cystic avascular blobs is one of them. Um, and the way we, we do this uh, cystic blobs uh, revision uh, is using an amniotic membrane. We published on this. We have close to 90% success rate on it. So you do a subconjunctival supratenance dissection. It's important that the dissection is supratenance. We do all of this under topical anesthesia, by the way, with subconjunctival um, what we call as a sugarcane juice back in Tampa. Uh, it's, uh, it's preservative lidocaine mixed with epinephrine, one in 1,000, 50-50 uh, concentration. You inject it, it's going to dissect the conjectiva for you, give you the anesthesia that is needed. Um, and once the dissection of the conjectiva on top of the blood is achieved, you extend the dissection posteriorly. The key here is this. You want to preserve the draining blood vessels, which are subtenons or within the tenons. And then you decrease the height of the blood by applying cautery, and then you do relaxing incision of the superior fornix to, uh, to both achieve adequate conjunctiva relaxation and also prevent ptosis. And then you pull the conjunctiva on top of the blob that's draped with a double, double folded amniotic membrane and suture it with tenonalon. Some people like to use Vicro for these kind of purposes. Vicro in about two weeks is going to become loose and the conjunctiva can regress. So using tenonalon is the best way, I think. I use a 7 o vicro for all of these surgeries, all glaucoma surgeries that are subconjunctival. I use a 7 o vicro to, to pull the eye down um, from the limbus and then use a tenonalon to complete the surgery. So in two, so we're using two sutures, complete the surgery. It's also important that you keep the price in mind because a lot of these patients may be cash paying, so you don't pass on the, the excess amount of uh, 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 suture or suture material that you're using to the patients. Now let's move on to express mini shunt, uh, developed by, how many of you actively practice glaucoma surgery, by the way? A lot of you. Have you done express? No? So express anyway, it's, uh, it's forgettable. Uh, came out in 2000s, uh, uh, no offense meant. It, it's, it, it's a good attempt towards modernizing glaucoma surgery, standardizing glaucoma surgery. Back in 2003, um, 1997 is Belkin from Israel developed it and it was FDA approved in 2003. It's a 27 gauge um, uh, diameter steel tube, a 400 micron external, 50, 50 micron internal diameter and it's about three millimeters long. Um, so the way the express works is, uh, is that you have to create a scleral flap just like the way you do for your trabeculectomy. And using a 27 gauge needle, what you want to do is to enter the anterior chamber just anterior to the, the Schlem's canal location. And then inject the express through that hole into the anterior chamber. It comes with a little flange. Now initially when express came out into the market, they marketed this as a um, Subconjunctival dissection followed by straight injection into the into the anterior chamber. Uh, that resulted in a lot of uh, incidents of hypotony, corridor effusion, subcortical hemorrhage, and exposure. We were the first ones to publish the paper, ex uh, uh, um, uh, pointing out that this technique is probably not suitable. Based on which they changed the technique and modified that into uh, into a trabeculectomy, a mini trabeculectomy flap, modified trabeculectomy flap, as is being shown here. Now the flange sits right there, and, the, and then what you do is to close the conjunctiva 
this will, the, some degree of regulation is there. Now the problem is this express also can lead to conjectival, the, the conjectival erosion and the scleral flap can erode through, uh, the steel plate can erode through the conjectiva leading to endophthalmitis or potential exposure to endophthalmitis. So you have to know how to take out express when such a thing happens. Here is one technique of doing that. There are a couple of ways of doing it. One is external, one is internal. The external technique, you got to make sure that, that uh, the, uh, the, on either side of the plate, you got to cut um, about a millimeter on either side so you can twist the express shunt out so it gets unhooked from the underlying sclera and you can take it out. Now the internal approach is kind of um, inventive in the sense that you make a um, paracentesis exactly 180 degrees opposite, use an MVR blade to under gonio view, you dissect the sclera on, on in either side of the express uh, for internally. And then using micro forceps under the cover of viscoelastic, you're gonna, you're gonna peel it into the, into the anterior chamber like you're see, seeing now, and then taking it out. So this way, you can preserve the blood and convert that express into a trib modified trabeculectomy if you want, okay? So both the approaches are, are good to know for you, for those of you who do express in the future. As you can see here, Peter Nedlin, one of my mentors, uh, published a paper on this back in the day in AJO 2014, two-year comparison of traverse as express. As you can see, the results are pretty similar. Except with Express, you have the added disadvantage of the cost, about $700 in the United States, and, um, and the fact that blood revision is not as successful with Express as with the trabeculectomy operation. And, and, and lastly, over a period of time, Express can find its way through, from under the skeletal flap and erode through the conjectiva, as you can see on those pictures, and cause endophthalmitis. Now, the Zen, it is a new age surgery that Anybody use Zen in the audience? No? Okay, Zen is recently introduced by uh, Allergan uh, in the United States about two years ago. It got FDA approval based on a study done, by, uh, uh, done in France. So it's a gel stent. It was approved in November 2016. Can be inserted ab internal or ab external, meaning that there's no conjectival dissection. So the entire game plan here now, we're shifting away from dissecting the conjectiva, which we think is attracting subconjectival fibrosis leading to failure, right? So is there a surgical technique that we can, we can implement in our practice that avoids subconjectival fibro uh, dissection? So gel is an example of that. Uh, diverse aqueous humor and subconjectival space via gel stent. Fluid flow regulation initially is uh, regulated by the length of the tube, okay? Now, but the long-term success or failure depends upon the subconjunctival fibrosis again. So end result is nothing, anything that you do, subconjunctival fibrosis is going to be determining whether the operation is going to be successful in the long term or, or not. As a, two examples, um, you'll see um, uh, on the left-hand side, it's ab internal technique, meaning that you make a paracentesis in the infrotemporal quadrant and you inject the express through it in the uh, in the right hand side, you'll see I have external technique where if you go through the subconjunctiva, three millimeters posterior limbus, you inject into the anterior chamber, enter the anterior chamber, and then you inject it. Um, so in the initial thought process, we all did have internal techniques, and uh, it was too cumbersome, so we switched over to have external technique. It's great. It takes you exactly three minutes. In three minutes, you're done with the glaucoma surgery. Right, I mean, that's so impressive. It's like doing cataract surgery at a good day, it takes me three minutes. So I can finish my glaucoma surgery in three, under three minutes and you're out. But are the long-term results comparable to trabeculectomy? Here is a paper that I presented in the American Glaucoma Society meeting this past year. Zen was a strab, I OP in my own practice and the five other practices, um, mostly my fellows that uh, did these surgeries. Uh, uh, and as you can see, they're very comparable. Okay, 14 millimeters of mercury versus 12 millimeters of mercury in the trabeculectomy group, 14 in the, in, the trial, in the Zen group at the end of one year. Even though there's a statistical significance there, but practically speaking, anything below 15 millimeters of mercury is good enough for people with advanced glaucoma. So in that sense, Zen is as good as TRAB, except you can see the, uh, the um, uh, if you look at the number of medications, Zen patients, need at least two, two drops 
as compared to 0.5 drops in the trap group. So you'll end up using more number of drops and probably do more number of needlings of the blood with the Zan patients um, compared to the trabeculectomy. Now, on the positive side, I've not seen a patient with supercolon hemorrhage with the Zan. Okay, so that's great news, right? But on the negative side, you still see endophthalmitis because of the exposure of the Zan um, through the conjunctiva that's uh, avascularized because of the mitomycin injection that they're giving. So there are downsides to Zan, it's, uh, and the cost involved is also high. But in three minutes, you can finish your glaucoma surgery and expect as good results as a trabeculectomy operation. Now, what else am I doing that is uh, help me out managing the subconjunctival drainage pathways or that we're creating artificially. It could be your trabeculectomy, it could be the expression, it could be the Zen, or in focus, the presser uh, new agent that's coming out. Um, in the near future, you'll be seeing uh, in focus, which is nothing but a Zen, but made of a different material. Okay, and these are going back to 1950s. There was a guy in South Africa by the name of Dr. Epstein. Epstein you know, conceived the idea of putting in a steel tube into the, into the anterior chamber, draining the aqueous into subconjunctal space. Now, within three to four months, all of these surgeries failed, and he conceived that there's something in the aqueous of glaucoma patients that attracts fibrosis, and that, scale, that came to be known as Epstein factor. Now we know that it's probably TGF uh, beta, beta TGF, right? Now, it, it turns out that no matter what you do, at the end of the day, fibrosis is going to decide the fate of these glaucoma surgeries. So we rescue a lot of these surgeries in the, in the clinic space using the 30-gauge needle. It's great if you can implement this because I can guarantee you every three years, every trap that you do is going to undergo fibrosis to the point that the pressure is 20 or higher. Either you got to put the patient back on traps or do something in the clinic space that will avoid taking the patient back to the operating room two-minute procedure with a needle at the slit lamp in the clinic under betadine cover and lido gel, you can achieve the same result and cut the cost down uh, tremendously for the patients, right? Now, here is an example of some of the examples of how we use the 30-gauge needle simply to resolve a lot of these pressing issues that you've seen. Here is a, here is a guy who presented with acute angle closure glaucoma. What do I do? 30-gauge needle at the slit lamp. In one minute, I am done resolving the attack. I mean, a lot of these patients, unfortunately, go through several different practices and would have had high pressures going on for like two, you know, a week or two weeks, throwing up because of the pain, and they come to me, and you can see the cornea cleared up immediately. 30 gauge through clear cornea into the anterior chamber, you stay there for one minute, the pressure almost immediately drops down to like 10 millimeters of mercury, take the needle out, the attack is gone, the pain is gone. Now you put the patient on all the glaucoma medications that you want, pilocarpine, take the patient for iridoplasty, and, if, and then a week or two weeks later when the eye is quiet, I take the lens out. I don't want to wait for these eyes to develop another attack. Why do you want to do that, right? And so that's my, the standard of care in my practice for angle closure glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma for the last 15 years now. Now how about the year is a secondary pupillary membrane with a flat chamber. This old lady in her 90s developed this acute attack of glaucoma, was admitted in the hospital with IV diamox and mannitol, has not resolved and got discharged. I finally found her way into my practice. When I saw her, the AC was almost flat with a pupillary membrane. The problem is a lot of uh, ophthalmologists really do not understand the mechanism of glaucoma. In this case, it's a pupillary block mechanism causing iris bombay. So I went in with my 30 gauge needle, subscleral, uh, sub iris into the other side and then broke the angle, broke the pupillary margin um, from the, the membrane. And as soon as I did that, you can see a gush of fluid came forwards and the attack is resolved. And, and I gave some catalog into the AC to prevent recurrent pupillary membrane formation at the end of this, and, and it never came back and the patient was happy. Now this case otherwise would have been taken to the operating room. Imagine a 90 year old lady in severe pain for two weeks, going to the operating room and going through the same procedure. I resolved this attack in less than two minutes in the clinic. Back in the day when I started, I do cornea procedures through a lot of them. Now, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, corneal endothelial transplants that we do in the presence of tubes is what I do. Their DSEC is perfect. You don't want to do a DMAC in the presence of tube because of the unstable anterior chamber. This was my first attempt to do DMAC 
um, in a Fuchs dystrophy patient, and the, and the patient ended up with a, uh, a pupillary block glaucoma because of excess uh, air bubble that are left in the antechamber, right? And these are the cases that you do, really don't need to take the patient back to the operating room. I, as, as you can watch, 30 gauge needle into the antechamber, half of that air bubble escapes out, the attack is resolved, the graft is still attached, and the, uh, and the painful episode is over. Watch this, I just really tap into the AC, half of that fluid air bubble is gone, the graft is still attached, attack is over, and the patient is comfortable, and she went on to do well. How about putting in a tube in a 13-year-old with Axenfeld Rigert syndrome? Here is a patient, he did great for the first week, came back two weeks later with a flat chamber. The grandmother admitted that the child is rubbing the eye, and he came back with a flat chamber. Not only that, the tube is also stuck into the, punctured the, the anterior capsule, stuck into the lens. So I used a 30-gauge needle on viscoelastic, injected the viscoelastic into the anterior chamber and pulled the tube away from the lens and reformed the chamber. And the, 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 the patient did very well after that. Now, here, this particular blub is special because, do you, do you remember Shea from 1950s in Philadelphia? He's the, he's the first guy to have introduced the concept of doing a sclerotomy. Okay, full thickness sclerotomy. And this is the Shea's blub. This particular patient had congenital glaucoma, and he told me in 1970, he was one of the last patients to have had surgery by Dr. Shea himself. Um, and what happened over the years, it functioned very well. Now, I think by looking at that blood, Dr. Shea probably did not only his thermal sclerotomy, but also did iron clysis because there is iris pillar stuck in the, you see the brown color is probably iris pillar stuck in the subconjunctile space. In 60s and 70s in Boston and Philadelphia, it was very common for people to have iron clysis. Great surgery. I've seen during my fellowship here in Mass India, I've seen many number of patients with iron clysis fell by the wayside simply because a couple of reports surfaced with uh, 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 sympathetic ophthalmia. And so nobody does iron clysis anymore, but I think it's, it's I think we should look at this as a surgical model again and see if we can modify that so sympathetic ophthalmia is taken out because it really does do very well even without myromycin. But anyway, this particular patient came in, he had pressures of 40, went to Bascom Palmer, they did a GAT procedure which is ab internal tribuclotomy 360 degrees. A week later the pressure was 40 and it was referred to me in Tampa because I just moved from Tulane to Tampa and you will see all I did for him was to needle the blood. And that was about a, about a year ago. And this patient, this pressure is 12 millimeters of mercury on no drops and he's still doing very well. I injected some subconjunctal mitomycin at the end of the procedure. And uh, these are the kind of cases that they're so cool that you can take care of the patient right there at the slit lamp. And uh, for any slit lamp procedure you want to do, I got to reiterate, use betadine prep, lidogel, Five minutes later is when you walk into the room, put a lid speculum, assemble the patient at the slit lamp, and the 30 gauge needle on a TV syringe is all that you need. That's, and, and the cautery. I use a cautery to, to cauterize the entry point of the needle. And these patients do remarkably well. And, and you know, I've been doing this for like 15 years. I had one patient with infection. Hundreds of cases have done, and now you can't argue that the rate of infection is any higher than what you would expect doing in the operating room. How about when you put in an amid valve? I, I realize that in, the, uh, in India now, um, uh, a lot of you are, are doing amid glaucoma valves and the new, new Adi from Arwin system, and these things will also get fibrosed. And when they get fibrosed, there is a entire lecture series that we have on how to tackle failing or failed glaucoma drainage devices, but one of the earliest things that I do is this. I needle the blood at the slit lamp and inject mitomycin in there. But injecting mitomycin in the presence of an amid valve is great because it's a one-way valve. We did these uh, studies 15 years ago where we injected fluorescein into the subconjunctal space and we saw that none of the, the fluorescein tracks itself back into the anterior chamber. So it truly is a one-way valve like Dr. Ramad claims. And so injecting metamycin into those locations is pretty safe. I do this at least two times before I give up. And it works great. So know your complications. Two of the fear complications 
of one of the most severe complications of subcortical hemorrhage, right? And the other one is coral effusion. If the coral effusion tray, um, coral effusion um, stays there for more than a month and or involving macula, then you got to drain it out. The same thing with subcortical hemorrhage. If the subcortical hemorrhage, the pain persists, or if it's, uh, it's kissing coroidals, you got to drain it out. Um, um, and in both, the technique is very similar in the sense that you, I usually do it in the infranasal, infratemporal quadrant simply because you want to preserve the superior conjunctiva for future glaucoma surgeries potentially. What I've done is always what I was taught by one of my mentors, Tom Hutchison, um, radial incision, this is as opposed to the retina guys who want to do a circumferential incision, uh, radial incision, four millimeters posterior limbus, four millimeters long, that will take you straight down into subcortical space. Be gentle, 15 degree sharp blade is what I use. And then you start draining it out. And uh, here you can see clear fluid coming out. And on the other side, you can see the same thing being done in a patient with subcortical hemorrhage. This was a patient that was referred in. Um, one of the general ophthalmologists did a combined cataract trabeculectomy operations. Patient ended up with a massive subcortical hemorrhage on the table. I waited for 10 days. You want to wait for 10 days in these patients. Really, uh, and the reason for that is the blood clots. Now, if the subcortical hemorrhage happens on the table, that's your one chance for you to drain, induce a sclerotomy at that time to drain the fluid, uh, the, the blood out. Even if you can get to two drops of blood, I can tell you the pain is going to be much less and the amount of uh, blood that accumulates is going to be remarkably low. Um, but if the patient comes to you with subcortical hemorrhage, then you got to wait for 10 days for the blood to clot, declot, and then do, do your surgical drainage. Now, one exception to this rule is if the macula is lifted off, the sooner you drain the blood, the better it is. And the only way you can do that is to inject TPA. And I've done that too. Four quadrant TPA injections into the supercolor space. You wait for about 10 minutes, and automatically the blood will drain out and the retina will flatten. So know your complications and know how to manage the complications. I want you guys to be complete glaucoma surgeons, not the old fashioned ones where you do a trabeculectomy and you think that's great and any other complication that happens, tell the patient, I'm so sorry. Don't do that. While you have the technique, you got the knowledge, you train yourself to completely manage glaucoma any which way. Now one of the things that get thrown to me is cyclodialysis cleft. Um, so here is a patient who came in with cyclodialysis cleft, hypotony, lasting for more than six months. You can restore vision for these patients if you close the cleft. Identify the cleft doing a good gonioscopy. And, uh, and then what you want to do, this is a technique where I did a scleral flap. You can do it even without scleral flap as long as you know where the, the cyclodialysis cleft is located. Opposite direction, 180 degrees away from the scleral, the, the cleft, you want to make a paracentesis. Now using a, you know that the tenoproline on long needle, a 1990 needle is what we call. Uh, using that, you use a mattress suture to close the, the cleft. Very easy to do, takes you less than seven minutes or 10 minutes to do this procedure and the patient will be so happy because the pressure goes up and once the pressure goes up, the macular hypotony, hypotony maculopathy will start resolving and over a period of two to three months, the vision will come back. Now. If the hypotony maculopathy persisted for more than one year, then you can have permanent faults and may not resolve and the vision may not improve. But before one year, this is worth doing for these patients. As you can see, I'm using a 27, 25 gauge needle to, um, to, to take that, uh, that thin uh, needle that's attached to the proline. It's uh, kind of tricky to handle this tenoproline. I just wanted to show you, even as experienced as I think I am, sometimes you struggle with that. And then you pull it out and you repeat the same procedure with the other needle. Now you have a nice matter suture, mechanical suture as, as, as it's known, inserting, attaching. Now when you tie it down, the, sclera, the ciliary body now gets reattached to the, to the underlying sclera and you close the cleft. Now remember one thing, once you close the cleft, it will take a few, um, a few weeks for the rest of the trabecular meshwork to remember how to drain. So there is a memory lapse to the trabecular meshwork, and, and so the pressure can acutely go up to 30 or 40 or 50. So the patient can come back in three to seven days with pain in the eye and pressures of 40 or 50. So be prepared for that, 
and also warn the patient if the patient is the eye is in pain, give him a, a couple of tablets of Diamox, ask him to take the Diamox pill and then come back to you and then you can adjust the glaucoma drops. The, having a pressure spike is a good deal because it tells you that your cleft closure is, is good, right? So this is end of part one. Um, you have any questions? Uh, that had undergone Shai's uh, uh, surgery uh -huh. 30 years back. So when do you decide that you need to needle? I won't do it for a, such a uh, long operated case. So how did you decide that needling would be uh, useful in this patient? That's my, if I see a, pa a patient with trab or valve and, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the pressure is going up, that's my first thing to go to. No matter how long, no matter how long it's been years, done. 40 years. I don't care. Okay. You'll be surprised. More than 50% of the time, I'm able to revise those blebs and bring the patient under the pressure under control. So you use mitomycin always subconjunctival? Yes. Needling. Yeah. I mean, I, and the exception being if the patient has avascular blebs. You don't want to induce more avascularity into those blebs and complicate the situation with mitomycin. Now, if you have to do mitomycin injection, you've got to be really careful. Okay. In a trabeculectomy operation, if you inject subconjunctival mitomycin and you drop the pressure before that with needling, there's always a danger of reverse flow, right? <laughs> the pressure in the inside the eye is low mm -hmm. and the mitomycin can track itself into the AC. Mm -hmm. And it's a real danger. Yes. And I've done that twice in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the results are not pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mitomycin in the AC in high enough concentration, he will cause a no, uh, uh, endothelial cell damage, the patient will end up to it reproding iritis, pigment peeling from the iris, and, and, and corneal decomposition. So you got to be really careful. Okay. Either you can do subconjunctival injection a week prior to the needling, or I don't have that amount of patients. So what I do is this, I needle the blood, I make sure that the fluid is coming out, and then I I point the needle all the way up to the 12 o'clock, like a few millimeters as just shown you there. Inject, I literally inject like 0 0.05 cc's. It's a couple of drops and of dose, dose. 0 0.4 milligrams. Same dose. Same dose. So my suggestion to you is this, standardize your dose, vary the time. Because you don't want to vary both of them. You will never learn from, from one patient that can be applied to the, to the next patient. So standardize your dosage, but vary the time and vary the amount of mitomycin that you're injecting depending upon the situation. Like with blood needlings, I always inject like maybe two or three drops of mitomycin far above and I leave it there because over a period of time it's going to mix with the aqueous and then come down and diffusely do what you want it to do. And so the technique of blood revision that you showed with AMG, so how many failures have you encountered with this? You're it's 90 percent success rate. I mean, uh, I think that's the best success rate with blood revision technique that's ever been published. Um, the, pre the other publications, other techniques that are described, one, you do a blabectomy, meaning that you take out that avascular cystic blood completely and draw the conjunctiva down all the way and close it, right? When you do that, almost 50% of the time, I can guarantee you this, 50% of the time over a period of four to eight weeks, subconjunctival fibrosis will, will come in and then you will end up with a very high pressures. Now you're scratching your head thinking, what am I going to do? Right? And so how do you use cautery in the OPD? It has to be sterile. So you have a sterile set up separately in your OPD? This is a, the underwater cautery that you have in the OPD. Oh, in the OPD I use a, um, a battery powered cautery. And the beauty of that battery powered cautery is okay. um, you can use alcohol wipes okay. and then clean it. So and then, not, and then it has you, a foot switch, right? No. It has no it's, no, it's no foot it's switch. Handheld. It is handheld okay. battery operated cautery system and it comes in two temperatures, if I remember correctly. We use the hot one and uh, so I ran this. So before I do anything in my clinic, I really do my experiments, okay? So one of my residents did this experiment wherein we dip this handheld cautery in different cultures, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, mm -hmm. and then we wiped it with alcohol. And then you cauterize, you, you press the button till the wire becomes red hot. Mm -hmm. And then we recultured it, zero bacterial growth. Okay. 
my wife is ID, and so I learned all of these techniques from her. And, uh, and uh, so, use this, so I use the same battery system for multiple patients with no what problems. With alcohol, no sterilizing, nothing. Alcohol wipe is great. Yes, ma'am. You'll be surprised. It's a, it's a mindset, okay? This is very similar to, remember back in the day you were doing intracaps versus extra cap, the jump that you made from extra caps into, uh, into FACO, and then topical FACO, giving up lutrovulvar. It's the mindset of the surgeon which is the limiting factor in my mind. I've been doing this like for 15 long years, and every time I present my entire set, you go to my YouTube website, by the way, meditrate.com, or put my name on YouTube. There's an entire series of procedures. I do 25 different procedures at the slick lamp, not only cornea and glaucoma, but cataract-related complications too that I deal with at the slick lamp. You'll be surprised how much efficiency can be established in the clinic setup doing these procedures. And the future, trust me, is doing these procedures in the clinic as we move away from these expensive operating rooms. But wouldn't it be more comfortable for the patient in the uh, OR? Well, you know, you want, it, it really is not, really is not. I, the reason why I say this is this, you talk to the patient, you tell the patient where to expect a little bit of pain. When you cauterize in the OR, the patient feels the pain, unless you are using general anesthesia. Unless you're using general anesthesia, they will definitely, and when we do these complex glaucoma surgeries and do subclinical fibro uh, dissections, there's always bleeding that takes place, and you have to do underwater cautery. When you do the cautery, the patient invariably feels the pain. So instead of spending, say, 10,000 rupees versus a 30 gauge needle that probably costs you 10 rupees in, the, in India, you, you do under lidocaine gel and betadine prep, I guarantee you, there's going to be very little pain and the patient tolerates. I always talk to the patient as they do the procedure. And, you know, except for a few instances, I don't ever remember a patient actually complaining. Thank you. For the AGV blebs that you had remodeled, the dose of mitomycin, is it the same that you put? Yes. Okay. Same concentration. And sir, it was a pleasure to see uh, your presentation with such, you know, such good videos. So my question to you is uh, that, uh, you know, while doing procedures in the OPD, so in our uh, setup, it's like a crowded OPD. So your OPD, do you have a separate, uh, like a zone for doing all these procedures? You have you segregated like, you know, this, this is where I see all the general patients and this is my whatever slit lamp. Have you segregated that? So it's a good question. I don't. I do run a very busy OPD. Of, I see about 100 patients every day. I do about 10 to 15 of these procedures every clinic. I've been doing this for like 20 long years. I just moved to Tulane where my practice is. I'm building up my practice. Down in New Orleans, we used to get referrals from four different states from across the entire South. And I used to have at least 10 to 15 of these procedures lined up for me in every clinic. I used to see about 100 patients a day. And I, I'm used to doing them in the clinic setup in no particular room allotted to it because all the rooms are designed the same way. Now, depending upon your practice and the volume that you have, you can choose to have a particular room designated in the OPD itself for you to do these procedures. Absolutely possible, yes. Thank you, sir. Um, can I ask you a question? Sure. Regarding, 20, uh, regarding the needling, uh, when would, do you do them all with 30 gauge needle or would it depend upon the amount of fibrosis? And if the fibrosis is too much, would you consider using a 23 gauge or a, or a thicker needle to cut the um, fibrous tissue? I like either the 30 gauge or the 27 gauge needle. Anything more than that for subconjunctival dissection is going to be too traumatic. You can puncture through the conjunctiva. So you gotta be careful. You don't want to puncture through the conjunctiva in multiple locations and now you develop a leaky blab that really needs to be taken to the operating room. Um, so, and, and the reason why half inch is, is mandatory, the longer the needle is, the less uh, strength you will have at the tip of the needle for you to cut the, the tissue with. So if you use a 30 gauge or 27 gauge, a half inch needle, either you're gonna cut, dissect it out successfully or you, you cannot, if I cannot do it, I'll take the patient back to the operating room and do something else. Like maybe put in a tube or something. Hmm. Yeah. So let's move on to the next topic, which is 
cataract surgery as a glaucoma procedure. There are at least five mixed pro studies that came out in the United States comparing cataract surgery to a FACO cataract alone versus FACO with mixed procedures. And um, so cataract surgery lowers IOP at least modestly for most patients with mild to moderate glaucoma and elevated pressure. Do we have evidence to suggest that? These are all the studies that are published in the recent past in the last 10 years. Very well run studies comparing almost 200 plus cases of cataracts alone with 200 plus cases of cataract growth mix. And what came out of it, the most noticeable result out of this for me, take home message from all of these studies is uh, at the end of two years, there's a sustained decrease in the intraocular pressure in those with cataract alone in patients with mild moderate glaucomas. About three to five point, three to five millimeters of mercury drop in intraocular pressure. So cataract alone could be considered as a glaucoma procedure for those patients with mild moderate glaucoma. Even if you don't combine that with anything else, it will cause a drop. Now, as to how long it's going to persist, does it happen in 100% of the patients? That's a different story. But for majority of the patients, cataract alone could be a treatment option, especially if they have an underlying cataract. Now, is cataract extraction indicated especially for glaucoma purposes itself? There are several examples where cataract alone is, is advisable as a treatment option, even if they don't have cataract. Let me rephrase that. Lens extraction as a treatment option for glaucoma is advisable under certain circumstances, as I give you the example here. Now remember, the natural lens is about five millimeters thick. It's about 10 millimeters in diameter along the equator. It's a biconvex lens is suspended to the ciliary processes for zonules, right? So here are examples of normal lens in abnormal eyes, meaning that these eyes are small, as in nanophthalmos. 16, 18 millimeters is the current definition, I think. 18 millimeters or less. Than, or less. Acute angle closure glaucomas, these eyes are small eyeballs to begin with. Chronic angle closure glaucoma, same problem. In South India, especially, chronic angle creeping angle closure glaucoma is very, very common. Um, now that I moved to Tampa, the Indian population in Tampa is huge. For the first time since I left India, I'm operating almost every week on someone from Indian subcontinent because there are a lot of people from from the subcontinent area there. And I see that these patients are represented of what you probably are seeing on a daily basis here, chronic angle closure glaucoma. They don't come with acute angle closure glaucomas. They come with creeping angle closure glaucoma. And there's a technique to attach them, uh, to, to treat these patients. These are surgical cases. These are not medical care. You can try some medicine and do a P, your PI and laser aldoplasty initially. That doesn't work. You got to take the patient to the surgery and then do something that will restore the anatomy balance back to where it should belong. Plateau iris syndrome, malignant glaucoma. <coughs> so nanophthalmos, as you all know, small eyes, no, normal size lens, shallow AC, angle crowding, hypermetropia. And in these cases, once the, you do your PI and uh, the PI is not sufficient enough to, to do the cataract surgery, remember the eye is under intense pressure and, uh, and the chamber is very shallow. So doing a utrata of forceps capsulorexis is not possible in a lot of these patients. So I use this, first of all, the pupil is constricted and tiny. So I use this, uh, what I call as collar buttons. These are reusable, cost you zero. Once you buy it, you can use the same instrument for thousands of cases. And then you do your capsulorexis using the cystotome needle. So I've trained myself to do capsulorexis using the cystotome needle in anticipation of doing this kind of cases. So I never use utrata in my practice. I do straight cataracts like this. I do narrow angles like this. Just so for that one particular pay, one patient that you might do in 100 cases, you want to train yourself to perfection on the normal eyes. And once you do that, you take the cataract out like you normally do. And then you do goniocynical lysis. And don't, you know, one of the common mistakes that a lot of people ask about is, it's a nanophthalmic eye, plus, let's say this particular patient was wearing 16 diopter hypero glasses, right? So they wanted to make her emetropic. First of all, when somebody's 16 diopters, there's no way you can get 20-20 or 6 by 6 vision in these patients. They're amblyopic to begin with. Two, 
you want to achieve such a high diopter lens, 45 diopter lens, unless you specially order that, or you want to do piggyback. In a crowded angle, you want to do piggyback technique, I think it's stupidity, asking for trouble. Now, this particular patient had 16 diopters with the maximum uh, the, uh, correction that I was able to get from Alcon 34 diopter lens or something. I was able to reduce it to six diopter hyperopia. Patient vision improved from count fingers to 20, I forgot, like, you know, 2080 or something, and she was ecstatic. They're happy. At the end of the day, what you want to aim for is happy patients, not for you to feel satisfied with yourself that I achieved the metropia, because there's no question of getting metropia in this kind of patients. So don't crowd the angle, do goniosynicolysis, and on top of that, I'll show you some of the techniques that will help control the glaucoma in these patients. Now how about angle closure glaucoma? We went through that. Here is an example of an acute presentation, severe pain, red eye, steamy cornea, mid-dilated pupil. How many of you see angle closures every week in your practice? A lot of you, right? So here is what I do. Um, to answer your question, this is a patient, cousin of an ophthalmologist, plus 13 diopter hyperope. She did a routine dilated exam and put the patient in angle closure attack. For a week, she tried to control it, and then on a Friday morning, she calls me and she says, can you take care of this patient? So the guy, I saw the guy, he's a Wall Street broker. I put him at the slick lamp. I said, in two minutes, I'm going to cure this attack. He laughed at me. He said, for a week, I've been throwing up. I said, trust me. So here, you can hear me talk. Actually, if I put the volume, you can hear me talk. And I talked to him about his life. I mean, I asked him, what do you do? What stocks you bro you sell? What do you recommend for me to buy? And I take his mind off of the procedure I'm doing, and then, you know, in, you, that's a real-time video that you're watching there with the guy stuck against it, a young guy. You know, and one thing about young men and women, you can show a needle to a young man, they will, they will immediately uh, go, go into a coma, right? I've, I've seen this time and again. You show a needle to a young person, young male, they cannot stand a needle. On the other hand, you show a needle to the woman, they're like, ah, okay, come on, stick it in, I don't care. And, and so here is a guy, young man, I, I stuck the needle, and you see the real-time video, and I cured the angle closure, and then what I do after that is this. Once the attack is done, corneal edema is resolved, now the patient is not in pain, the patient will, will say, okay, you can do anything now, that you have earned their trust and they will never go to see another doctor. Now, five minutes later, I put them in organ laser and do iridoplasty. That's in my next step. I don't go to YAG iridotomy because probably the outside practitioners have already done the iridotomy and it has not resolved the attack. I do iridoplasty, I peel the iris away from the angle, and once I do this, and, and the technique is very simple, multiples of three. 300 spot size, 30 spots, and 300 um, um, millijoules of energy, and 300 uh, milliseconds of uh, time, and you will get this. I have given up doing the PIs on narrow angles, by the way. That's my secondary procedure. Almost 100% of the patients with narrow angles that I, de I decide is applicable, I do aridoplasty. Why? For two reasons. It's pain-free, almost pain-free, and much safer because zero, almost zero inflammation. We are talking about black patients here. If they don't induce inflammation in black patients, it will not do so in white patients and less pigmented patient population. So I do a aridoplasty in 100% of my patients who come with this, and it, it will stay open for you know years on end. And in, in the few patients that come in six months later, a year later, where the angle is getting more narrow, now I do a YAG PI through the previously placed organ-laced aridoplasty score. Now that will decrease the amount of energy that you need to deliver. Also prevent from hyphemas that can potentially complicate doing a YAG PI in a virgin eye. So multiple ways, I win every single time. And the patient wins if I win, right? And after this, what do I do? I take the patient to the, I put the patient on IV, I mean oral diamox and glaucoma medications and some prednisone um, and let the eye cool down a week or two weeks later, bring the patient back when the cornea is clear, take the lens out. And at that time, I do a goniosynicolysis with the, um, we, the multiple ways of doing goniosynicolysis, by the way. You can do it with your viscoelastic cannula. You can do it with the, uh, the FACO uh, aspiration port by grabbing the iris gently and peeling it down and in. 
and that way you can peel the iris away from the angle 360 degrees. And this is one way of doing it using visco, visco uh, uh, dissection is what I'm trying to show there. And there are other ways of doing it using the micro forceps if you want to be more precise. I'll try to show you these difficult, different techniques as we go along. Um, here is a patient with a, with a flat chamber for during an attack. For one month, he's been going from one practice to another practice, finally found his way into me, into my practice, and you can see that there's almost no chamber there. And I, I needled the blood multiple locations, and I was able to reform the chamber, drop the pressure down to 20, waited it out, and then took the cataract out, and he did great. He's from Thailand originally. In Florida, Florida is very similar to, to the Indian subcontinent. I'm seeing a lot of infections. Fusarium is very prevalent in Florida. The first case that I saw was a young boy, 13 year old. All he did was to go for a sleepover to his friend's place, came back home on Saturday morning and told his mom, who happens to be a school nurse, that my eye is irritable and, uh, and he's not feeling well. So the mom takes him to the urgent care, which has become very prevalent in the United States, unfortunately. And the only thing that the urgent care people do is to give a shot of steroids. Anything and everything is a viral infection, give a shot of steroids. So he gets a steroid shot into his arm, and he goes home. By Wednesday, he could barely open his eye. He comes back home early. And uh, he goes to a regular, after, the mom takes him to a regular ophthalmologist, who unfortunately agreed with the urgent care people and said yes, and put the patient on every hour dorsal. So by the time this patient ended up on my desk on Tuesday morning, the following Tuesday morning, from a mile, you can see that picture. That's that's fungal infection until proven otherwise. Absolutely no question about it, right? So the patient had acute glaucoma, the pressures were like greater than 70, and that's the reason for the pain. And that was one of the first cases that I tackled with acute glaucoma with fusarium, invasive fusarium. By this time, the fusarium has gone into the antechamber and has gone under the, the iris through the pupil. And so I took the patient to the operating room, and um, what did I do? I, uh, I was try attempting to debulk this cornea and then put a therapeutic tectonic uh, graft. In the middle of it, what came out? The lens, because I was such a, under high pressure. And that moment, I knew I lost this eye, because once the lens is out, vitreous is out along with it, that means vitreous stage fungus, and fungus invades the vitreous, retina is gone. In a matter of days, I lost this eye, became tricycle, and I myself had to do an evisceration. That's something I do too. I do my own enucleations. Unfortunately, I had to do several of those eviscerations. I do those. Ptosis surgery. 13% of all glaucoma patients following surgery develop ptosis. My old people don't trust anybody else. So I, I learned my own ptosis. I, I actually do wonderful ptosis surgery. I do my own ptosis on my patients. So it's a one-stop shop. They come, anything anterior segment, I'll take care of them. That's what all you young surgeons here have to train yourself to be. So here is a lesson for you. Once I learned this lesson, I modified my technique. So next time round, on a monthly basis, I'm getting this kind of referrals. Here is a 60-year-old lady who came in for two months, she's been going from one practice to another practice in Central Florida, and they've been treating her with uh, antibiotic drops, when in fact what she has is fusarium, and the pressure was like 50. So what did I do for this particular patient to answer your particular question? I do vary the size of the needle, but here, because the glob is so thick, I had to use an 18-gauge needle. Watch this, what happens? By the time I suck out the anterior chamber, there. The size of the actual infiltrate is only three millimeters. The fungus is only three millimeter infiltrate cornea, but the amount of um, material that is secreting into the anterior chamber is, is fills almost 80% of the anterior chamber. Every single case I see this. So this is my new treatment of choice for all acute fungal infections with acute glaucoma. Works like a charm. And what happens is this, I suck it out, now I fill the chamber with amphotericin B injection fluid, and, and, and then, of course, the patient is on oral varconazole and then topical natomycin drops every hour, right? And I wait it out till it calms down, and then I do a cataract surgery on these patients. I mean, cataract and, uh, and, uh, and uh, corneal transplant, and invariably they develop angle closure glaucoma, so I put a tube in these eyes. The first thing that I do is to put a tube in the eye to control the glaucoma. You don't want to put a tube when there is active infection, by the way. Why? Because you now you're going to try and give a pathway for the fungus 
to travel all the way into subconjugal space, into the retroarmal space, and you will be in bigger trouble than before. So make sure that the infection is completely controlled before you put the patient uh, on glaucoma, surgical techniques, whatever you want to do. But in these kind of cases, there's only one surgery that's indicated, which is a glaucoma drainage device. So these eyes will never see 2020, but you can restore, take away the pain, restore some degree of vision so they have depth perception. So they will need multiple transplants simply because the first transplant invariably is going to fail. Then they will have a bound down pupil with a white cataract. So you need to learn how to take the cataract out. Um, uh, uh, later on in the day, I have another talk on complex cataracts and glaucoma and corneum diseases. Uh, so the, the essence of what I was going to show there is use vision blue through a hazy cornea to visualize the, the capsule so you can actually do a capsulorexis, deliver the nucleus under viscodissection into the anterior chamber and take the nucleus out. So here's plateau iris syndrome. Plateau iris syndrome, my colleague in uh, Ananda Institute, Dr. Tarunam, she published a paper, the incidence of plateau iris seems to be pretty common in South India. Um, and they, these patients have anterior iris root insertion leading to angle closure, most often caused by anterior deposition ciliary processes. So how do we tackle this? Do you guys see plateau iris? You can see that the angle is wide open. Um, and, uh, and this patient did very well. And now at the end, when you do See ECP or endocyclophotocoagulation to the iris, uh, to the ciliary processes, you, there will be inflammation. So you want to use Kenalog to prevent this inflammation from, uh, from causing problems to the patient. So routinely I uh, inject diluted Kenalog at the end of the case, focused into the sulcus so the Kenalog particles get stuck to the inflamed ciliary processes and, uh, and that will be the end of it. Any questions? As many as many quadrant as as you can as you can do. So because you're sitting on the temporal side, and these are rigid steel tubes, you can do only up to three or four clock hours. Yes, anything that you do is always a risk of cyclodialysis, always a risk of uh, aerodialysis. Um, so you got to be careful. So you just yeah. You, you just have to be careful when you're inside the angle. So in the mechanical technique that you show, you use the needle that could go... The needle is about 14 millimeters long, I think. So any, 12 or 14. Any 12. company? Huh? Any Alcon. Company? Alcon. Alcon, Alcon is what we use, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So for uh, ECP, uh, you're, uh, as you have told, you are doing uh, around 180 degrees only. So what are your results? Because the latest what uh, papers are showing, they're saying that if you do more quadrants, it's more effective. Right, right, right. In the technique that I showed you, it's only possible to do only up to that, if at all. You know, most times you can do maybe three, qu three clock hours, and you cannot do more than that. Um, so the 180 degree, the 360 degree technique that they're talking about is by giving, doing sclerotomies, right, in the supertemporal infro nasal quadrants, and then you go in through the sclerotomy and through parts planar technique, you're applying to more of that. There's another paper in which they're just making an opposite incision. I know. Or they're not e even entering the sclerotomy. Right. They just, and then they, they are claiming that they can at least do, you know, 270 to 300 degrees. That's true. That is true. The more you do, the more you get. I, I'll show you, we published a paper comparing phaco goniosynicolysis versus phaco goniosynicolysis and ECP using the three, four clock hour technique. And we showed that the effect of ECP is about two millimeter drop in the intraocular pressure. More. And it, more, mm -hmm. and it persists only up to six to eight months. Okay. And this is true for all the papers from ECP. So ECP is not your long-term solution for pressure control. It does not do that. It does give you a bump in IOP reduction in the first few months after the surgery. So let's move on to mix. So here we are concentrating on diverting the aqueous humor into the Schlebs canal. Um, so these are non-blood-based surgeries um, uh, and they're becoming more and more common. 
because the complication rates are so little um, in our practices. Uh, the key learning point here is that IOP achieved can never be below episcleral venous pressure, right? And, and usually 17 plus or minus three millimeters of mercury. So the canal-based surgery is um, you can remove the trabecular meshwork. Oh. Sorry, I didn't, okay, so, so the, the, you can remove the TM or the trabecular meshwork, okay, Tra using the trabectome or KDB or Kahoot dual blade. Now, Kahoot dual blade is being marketed by New World Medical, it's cheap, innovative, and is reusable, even though the company tells you it's not reusable, they want you to use one, one, one time and then discard it, you don't need to do that. Uh, you really can use it multiple times, trust me. Okay, don't tell the company that I said this. They're good friends, huh? I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, but you can use it multiple times. Huh? Yeah, so, so you can use it multiple times, okay? And, uh, and, and uh, so you can get a big bang, bang for your buck using the Kahook dual blade, and it's very effective. I mean, uh, I've given up doing trabectoma a long time ago. It's too expensive. You have to have like a FACO unit, a, a bag attached to it, and everything else. It's too complicated. This one, in literally one minute, you can slip three clock hours of the trabecular mesh work, and you're done. So bypass the TM with, uh, you can have an intact trabecular mesh work and bypass it using the eye stent techniques, OK? You can do the trabeculotomy 360 degrees. Now remember in congenital glaucoma, we used to do the ab external trabeculotomy 360 degrees. How many of you do congenital glaucomas? You do the 360 degree trabeculotomy? You do, a, okay, three, two clock or trabeculectomy, trabeculotomy technique. But you can extend. MVR, okay, yeah, so, so uh, you can do a 360 degree ab internal trabeculotomy, like the old fashioned uh, canal plasty, you do it ab external, here you do ab internal, and the stretch the canal doing canal plasty or ab external um, um, canal system. I'll show you multiple examples of this and I'll show you what I do in my practice. Here's an example of simple um, uh, cataract, uh, uh, eye stent implantation. Um, this is the original eye stent. Um, so you inject that into the, into the Schlem's canal through the trabecular meshwork. Um, there's a learning curve to this, um, uh, and uh, this was made popular by Ike Ahmed uh, uh, over the years. And then Kahook Dual Blade, which is Malik Kahook's invention, he invented this for his lab pur purposes, suddenly realized this could be a way to control glaucoma, and that's Malik Kahook for you. Um, and then somebody like me, I do multiple procedures. What I do is to combine uh, the canal procedures with ECP, and the combination of two is better than just doing one. And, and, and so the average intraocular pressure that you get is about 16 millimeters of mercury plus or minus three with these mixed procedures. There are complications of pretty close to zero unless you induce it. You got to learn how to use your gonial lens with your left hand if you're right-handed, and then use your instrument, whatever technique that you're gonna use with your right hand and visualize the angle, do the procedure, and then come out without scraping the, the endothelium or causing cyclodialysis clefts. By the way, all these complications have been, uh, have occurred and I've taken care of those complications from some of my colleagues in uh, different parts of the country. So they do happen. So learn how to do the techniques before you start doing, the, doing them on the patients, right? So mostly they're indicated for mild, moderate glaucomas because pa patients with advanced glaucomas, you want pressures to be below 15. A lot of these mixed procedures, they give you intraocular pressures around 16 millimeters of mercury, plus or minus. Now, there are variations to the team and I'll try and show you uh, how. Here is a patient with uh, chronic angle closure glaucoma. You can see the patient is pigmented. He, he actually happens to be of Indian extraction. I thought it would be cute for me to show you this. So take the cataract out. And once the cataract is out, you place the lens in. And uh, you go in and I am doing a goniosinicolysis and also angle stripping the trabecular meshwork using the Kahook dual blade here. See the Kahook dual blade? Once the blade is so built, once the tip lodges itself into the canal, it's very easy to walk it 
both ways to strip about three or four clock hours worth of uh, trabecular meshwork. And then the meshwork can be peeled off using a micro forceps. And then I combine that with ECP and then my catalog technique. And uh, the patient did very well on one or two drops. Now from four drops with pressures of 30, 30, 35 millimeters of mercury, pressure dropped down to 15, and the patient did very well with two drops. You know, I avoided doing a uh, trabeculectomy operation for this particular patient with all its potential complications, right? Now, when you do any glaucoma procedure combined with cataract surgery, please do not fall into a trap of this sutureless cataract surgery. What happens is when the pressure drops down, the wound will open up, suck the tears with bacteria, potentially bacteria, and you will end up with uh, endophthalmitis. So don't ever do the mistake of combining cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery and, and do sutureless cataract surgery. Surgeries that reduce aqueous production. Now the key learning point here is unpredictable results. Either too little or too much of the IOP reduction will occur because both ECP and micropulse are getting to be more predictable is what they claim but it's not true. Okay, the companies tell you one thing, but the practical results in, in our clinical practices are different. Now, these procedures result in ciliary processes, destruction. Back in the day, we used to do cyclocryo. I think all the older pop surgeons here probably are familiar with cyclocryo. Young people probably have never seen a cyclocryo in your office. I still do have a cyclocryo in my practice. It is very effective for some patients, blind, painful eyes. I do use cyclocryo. The problem with the cyclodiode and cyclocryo, over a period of time, what happens is, yes, the pressure reduction happens, but the eye still stays painful for about a month before it becomes comfortable, number one. Number two, the, they eventually develop band keratopathy and disfiguring eye. Uh, if you follow these eyes over a number of years, they invariably develop band keratopathy in a lot of these eyes. So I don't particularly like that technique, but it's something that I still use. ECP and micropulse, on the other hand, um, and I've shown you this example of ECP um, in this particular patient, so I'm going to skip this particular video. Micropulse, we published the largest, I think, I believe the, the largest series on micropulse recently, 200 eyes, and uh, results with micropulse. Uh, this is diode laser, by the way, and, and it's supposed to work one of two ways. One, it's going to attack the ciliary processes to decrease aqueous production, but there is more and more evidence that it actually works by relaxing the ciliary muscle fibers, like a prostaglandin analog, increasing the uveal scleral outflow pathway. But the results, about 71% success rate in the study that we did from multiple sites, and you, even though it's 70% success rate, it was most effective in patients with mild to moderate glaucomas, primary open angle glaucoma. When it, come by, when it came to complicated glaucoma, secondary glaucomas like PKP glaucoma, UVA glaucomas, glaucomas with other disease processes, it really did not do well. Less than 20% success rate. So I am not a big fan of micropulse, even though the companies are banging on your door to try and use it as a uh, non-invasive technique for controlling glaucoma. Some people do it. So there are, there are multiple examples of uh, devices that are mixed procedures that I've shown you. Indwelling devices like the eye stent, eye stent inject. The only difference between inject and the eye stent itself is they have two, um, two eye stents um, that you, you, you shoot straight into the TM, so insertion is a whole lot easier than the original eye stent. Hydrus is a new kid on the block that's been introduced in the United States about a year ago. That's a longish tube that occupies three clock hours um, that you inject into the trabecular through the trabecular meshwork into the canal. Now, the incisional or excisional ablative canal dilation techniques include the canalplasty um, or segmental excision or goniotomy like with the Kahook dual blade and the GAD procedures with the omni or with the suture. So eye stent inject pivotal trial, you can see a 14% reduction in intraocular pressure at the end of uh, two years, uh, three years. In the horizon ECD endothelial cell count stay in the hydro study at the end of the five years, they've shown that there is no difference in the endothelial cell count between the, those who received the hydras versus those, the, those that received only cataract surgery. So they're pretty safe compared to the transcleral 
um, uh, cyclodialysis cleft kind of a the situation with the cypass. Um, so we did the, one of the original studies comparing which of these techniques is superior, right? So in this particular example, we, we compared eye stent versus Kahoop dual blade at one year in my own practice, and you can see they're pretty comparable. It doesn't matter whether you use the expensive eye stent versus the cheap Kahoop dual blade. The results are about, about similar in both, in my hands at least. 12 months follow-up in these patients with mild primary glaucoma, and none of them had experienced any complications. And a lot of them were off the drops, and so that way they're happy. We also did a study comparing fake emulsification with goniocynical lysis with and without ECP. And as I was telling you before, you can see the results. You can see there is a bump. There is a decrease in the intraocular pressure in the ECP group in the first six months by about two millimeters, and then by the end of the year, they're about the same. There's no statistical difference between the ECP group and the non-ECP group. So that's what you're going to get out of this. Here are examples of how to do your uh, eye stent inject. The, the, so mastering these techniques is important for you when you start doing these uh, this mixed procedures. When you do your routine uh, cataract surgeries, um, uh, you know, turn the patient's head and lower the microscope and use your viscodilating cannula to practice visualizing the angle structures, angle anatomy. So that's the eye stent inject. You can see two eye stents being injected through the TM side by side to drain more of the aqueous. So the idea there is to identify where the canal, uh, 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 canals are located uh, and then inject the eye stent in those locations. So you can see a nice reflex of aqueous coming through and uh, that's the stent inject. Now here is an example of uh, hydrus going through the trabecular meshwork. And once it goes through, it comes on a wheel, if you like, that you control with your thumb. And as you roll the thumb, the, the hydrus, you can see that, uh, that uh, the, the shiny um, device going through the trabecular meshwork into the canal and then uh, at the end of it, you make sure that too much of it is not exposed into the anterior chamber, just the tip, and then you come out. And there is your example of hydrus. Now, this is a new technique that uh, I've been using, and I'm pretty impressed with the results. It's called Omni. It comes with the same technique as uh, your GAT procedure. Um, so the, the tip of that instrument is punctures the trabecular meshwork. It comes with a proline suture inside it that's controlled with a wheel with your right thumb. And as you inject the proline, it goes 180 degrees into the canal all the way up to the temporal end. And then as you withdraw, it's going to inject viscoelastic and dilate the canal. Now, using this, you can like, what I'm doing there is to strip the trabeculotomy, uh, the trabecular meshwork in the superior half. So we're doing what we call as 180, 180, 180 trabecular, 180 degrees trabeculotomy, 180 degree viscodilation. Uh, we are trying to compare the results, um, 180, 180 versus 360 degree viscodilation. Um, I don't have the results yet, but this is an instrument that I, I seem to like more and more. And almost every week I do two or three of these cases now. So in about a couple of years from now, I'll publish the results on, on these techniques. So a lot of these mixed procedures, the results or long-term results are still not known. And uh, they are not suitable probably for advanced people with advanced glaucoma. Now having said that, what I do, you do use them for in patients with advanced glaucoma. For example, you have a patient with, say, trabeculectomy that failed, now or borderline on two or three drops, right? And the patient developed cataract. So when I take the patient back to the operating room, I'm going to take the cataract out. In another three minutes additional time, I'm going to do this omni procedure with viscodilation and then revise the blubber and come out. And now I give the opportunity to the patient to get rid of the drops and potentially next four or five years of successful intraocular pressure control. So you can mix and match this, these procedures to control this, um, um, uh, the glaucoma, and try and vary it. I don't think it's related only to uh, patients with mild moderate glaucoma. I think you can use them wisely for patients with advanced glaucoma too. Any questions? So right now it's Omni. Um, so I used to do a lot of eye stents. We did a whole bunch of eye stents before Kahoot dual blade came to the market. And then I did a whole bunch of Kahoot dual blades. 
Now that Omni is in the market, I like the concept of viscodilation and doing goniotomy both at the same time with the same device at the, about the same cost as far as the uh, surgical center is concerned. As a Kahook dual blade. It is not reusable. That's the one downside. But in the United States, I can't reuse the Kahook dual blade anyway. But, huh? You, you can do it here. Now, Omni is something that you cannot reuse simply because uh, the way the device has been um, uh, developed, you cannot, you just cannot reuse it. Uh, but Kahook dual blade, I think, is the way to go in India if you want to start doing canal procedures. Uh, so, depends upon your patient base, right? Uh, you don't want to have patients with HIV, serious infections, et cetera, in this category. Um, you want to, you can, so it's the, the handle is made of plastic. So you can't do the autoclave. It will, it will kind of melt. But that's why I said, if you want to do it, use it 10 times, then you got to use uh, like alcohol wipes to clean the tip. Because really speaking, TM has no blood in there, Schlumps canal has no blood in there. So when you, when you walk into that area, you clean it, uh, you take it out, and then as soon as you come out, you use alcohol. Um, my wife who's sitting there in the back, she's an infectious disease specialist, and so she probably is cringing, but I've done it all. My incidence of infection is very low, I can tell you this, and I try it out in your practice. Yeah, that's what you should do. So the last topic for today is the glaucoma radius devices. And some of the stuff that I'm going to show you here is uh, um, not approved by FDA at this point in time. And I do have patterns and, and uh, um, I, I do have uh, 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 the company that, that is trying to market this is, belongs to me. So I want you to know that. So here is an example of Audi. Um, the Arwin system, this is actually the bar vault from where the RD system is developed from. So the way I do this, I almost never use it as a primary procedure, by the way. So I always do it if the trap is failed, then my next to go would be in a patient who needs low pressures would be some device like this. And I don't do the 350 ever. I don't think there is any reason, any difference between 250 um, plate versus the 350 plate. The only thing that the 350 is going to do is to give you complications muscle imbalance and diplopia incidence is much higher. And the surgical technique is also will take you longer. So here I'm using, this is pretty standard with all the great glaucoma drainage devices that we do. We uh, uh, tie, it, tie it down with, uh, with uh, either tenonylon or tenoproline, make sure that it's securely sec um, uh, secured to the underlying sclera. And then once that's done, the rest of the surgery is pretty easy. Now, before I do this for, the, for this uh, bar vault kind of a device, non-valve device, right? So you want to tie the tube shut. That's what I do. I use a 7 o Vicro tight shut. So in about three to four weeks, the Vicro will dissolve and the tube will start functioning. So in the meantime, you want to, you want to avoid having the, pressure, the patient having high pressures, right? So what I do is this. I take that opportunity to open up the failed trypecolectomy operation to make it functional. I use the same 23 gauge butterfly needle that I used to enter the anterior chamber for the, for the tube insertion and open up the scleral flap of the failed trypecolectomy operation and then apply some mitomycin in the surrounding vicinity and close the conjunctiva. So that the trab, now the revised trab is gonna control the intraocular pressure in the first four to six weeks and by the time the trap decides to start failing from fibrosis, my vicral tie is going to start dissolving, melting away, and the, the, the tube will start functioning. And between that partially working trap and this tube, I almost invariably get pressures between 10 and 14 without any drops. It's a great technique for you guys to practice. A lot of people don't understand the mechanics of it, so they're too scared of doing it. Um, occasionally, when the trap fun functions for too long, and too well, and the tube opens up, you may end up with hypotony, but given time, 
in low steroid usage, there's enough fibrosis that the patients will develop and it will stabilize with uh, great pressures that will sustain itself into the long term. So that's how I use your, if I were to be doing the Arvin system, that's how I would be doing it. That's been my standard over a period of long time. How many of you have done or doing glaucoma drainage devices now? And mostly what? The AD, ADI, right? Okay, that, so that's the technique that I use. I almost never do it as a primary procedure because if you do a primary pro as a primary procedure and then you tie it down, shut. The problem with that is no matter what technique you use to control the imme immediate intraocular pressure, I can tell you they are so variable. You can never get the intraocular pressure in a regulated fashion. So this technique of revising the failed trabeculectomy operation helped me immensely. Um, now, I'm going to show you variations of the theme. Here is a patient with a tight scleral flap. Um, the patient has scleroderma. The conjunctiva was bound down to the underlying sclera. Pressures were 40 on diamox and four different kinds of drops. 80-year-old lady. Nobody wanted to touch this patient. So the choice was to do a cyclodestructive procedure versus putting in a tube. So what do I do? This is a great technique, by the way. Um, do a little peritomy. See, now I do all my dissection in this kind of case where the conjunctiva is bound down to the underlying sclera using the 15 degree blade. So you go into the superficial sclera, not, the, not only the conjunctiva but the superficial sclera, and dissect the superficial sclera for the first four millimeters. Typically, in a lot of these cases, after the first four millimeters of dissection, you can jump into the subconjunctival space from there. Right? Now, because the space is so limited, I use a pediatric amid valve in this particular case. Now, with your, if you want to use the ID device, does it come with a 250 plate too? Yeah. You're using AGV more. The pediatric AGV is what I used in this particular patient. So don't be under the false impression that pediatric AGV or the FE8 model is restricted only for pediatric patients. It does work for adults too, okay? So in this particular patient, because of limited space, I use the pediatric AGV. Now, if you don't have the pediatric AGV, you can always clip that plate with your Vescot. Or you can change the shape of the plate and the dimensions of the plate to the dimensions that fit into the patient's eye. So don't hesitate cutting it. Just make sure that the edges are round when you, when you cut that. And, and then tie it down. And it, when it's inferior, I make a scleral flap. Under the scleral flap, I put, enter the anterior chamber, put the tube in, and close the conjunctiva. This is a great technique for you to use a scleral tunnel under the scleral flap, and you don't need to put a overlying scleral patch graft that looks ugly when the patient, you know, inferiorly on the superior, time, superior conjunctiva limbal area, it doesn't matter if you place a patch graft. But inferior patch graft is almost always visible, and patients do notice that. So inferior conjunctival dissections, I do this technique and it, it works very well. In this particular patient, I did use an overlying scleral patch graft simply because the sclera was so thin to begin with. And it's a great technique and the patient was very happy with the results. Um, so I'm trying to show you this as a variation to the team. Now, sometimes when you do your dissection, you might end up with a huge, right? You, you, you suture the plate and then you realize you, you had a large buttonhole. So what do we do in those kind of cases? You can close the tenons into stenons of the conjunctiva in two separate layers. I use, for this instance, uh, in this instance, I use a BV needle, the 90 vicryl and a BV needle, close the tenon in one layer and the conjunctiva in another layer. Now, in a patient who does not have tenons, you can borrow tenons from the surrounding, like inferior conjunctiva, dissect out some, uh, some tenons, bring it up, and do a pursuing suture, close it, tenons to tenons, and then close the conjunctiva on top of that, and they do very well. If you do only the conjunctiva, the chances of this um, uh, buttonhole opening up is very high, especially in this case, it's located on top of the plate. Once the plate is exposed in the post-op period, I can tell you this, you have to take the plate out. So you can see it's, it's nicely closed, and, and, and you can see that the area is sealed shut. It's a great technique for you to have. Always have something in your brain for any potential complication that you can face in this uh, glaucoma surgeries. Now, so what, what, what do I do if uh, the... 
Are we running out of time? Okay, we'll be, we'll be in our last two, two slides. Okay, so what do we do if, we have, if the AGV has failed? So you can needle, needle the blub like we're doing, or do what we call as a blubectomy. Here's a great technique for you. You, you subconjectural dissection, reflect the conjunctiva, and then what you want to do is this, cut the scleral flap, the, the capsule itself with a 15 degree blade, and once you dissect it down, you will see that in almost every single case of Ahmed valve that has failed, you see a fibrous tongue going into the valve itself, and then you, uh, you take that out, apply myromycin, and pull the conjunctiva back, and um, the, you will get about 50% success rate in two years with uh, two drops in this, in this patient. So that's how I tackle those Ahmed valves that fail. Okay, so last video here for you. If you have persistent hypotonia once you place a tube in, what do we do? Very simple technique is this. Make a paracentesis through cleocornia on top of the tube, fill the antechamber with viscoelastic, bring the tube out with your 0.12 in, out of the antechamber, tie it with tenoproline, double knot it, tie it shut, and drop the tube back in, close the paracentesis with a single suture, tenonylon suture, you're done. Great technique. In five minutes, you're literally done rather than doing conjectival dissections and then tying it behind all those techniques. This works great. If the pressure goes up too high in the post-op period, you can laser that uh, vicral suture at the slit lamp and save the day for yourself. Okay? Huh? That's pro proline that I'm using. Even proline you can laser. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop it because we're not running out of time. Professor Ayala for these beautiful videos. Any other questions? Maybe we could take them up outside. Outside, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, a lot of these videos are posted on YouTube. Um, find them, and uh, so if you have any questions, you can email me. Glad to answer.